I love cars. Emotion. <laughs> Adrenaline. Welcome to Thomas's driving lounge. Freedom. Going anywhere you want to go at any given time. So many memories and moments are connected with driving a vehicle. I've been a car enthusiast ever since. And there's so much I remember connected to great experiences in iconic vehicles that belong to the family or to friends. Things you just don't want to forget. And in my job as a car reviewer, I still enjoy every single new vehicle as much as the first one. But I started thinking, how can we preserve these experiences for future generations? How can children and future children still enjoy and become a car enthusiast like we once did? Is it actually possible to still behave like we do and still do something for other people, animals and the environment? Can we combine driving great vehicles, having fun and sustainability? We basically cover every kind of vehicle and we know it's better to walk or take the bicycle. And we often do, of course, but we all want to live a modern life and still enjoy driving a vehicle. But the time is over where we just don't care what happens next. When I started reporting on sustainability 10 years ago in the automotive industry, people just made fun of me, said this is going nowhere, no one cares, shut up, maybe even threatening me, especially the animal leather industry who tried to silence me, or on the contrary, bribing me, trying to influence my work when I was pushing for more sustainable car interiors. 10 years later, everything looks different and making cars more sustainable and using better, new and animal-free materials has become daily work in the automotive industry. And actually, this was started by our channel and our reporting and our community here. Ever since then, I strongly believe that we can achieve something together. And that's why I always talk to the automotive industry people when we attend driving events. And for example, I met those at BMW who shared their vision of a more sustainable future. But I was wondering, is it really all true? Is it just about claims? Is it just about greenwashing? Or what's really behind it in changing the whole way we produce cars today? For this, we went through a huge effort presenting you in detail what can be done to produce cars in a more sustainable way and solving very important questions like why is this car smoking weed? <laughs> okay, that came unexpected. For this, no, not for the wheat, for the cars. I came to Munich, Germany, the city of famous German beer. There we go again. Yeah, and even beer bikes. <laughs> well, as you know, Munich is also one of the main capitals in Germany for real cars. If you want a real insight in the automotive industry and into sustainability, you have to watch this video. In this documentary, we will tell you all about the future BMW strategy with electric vehicles and combustion engines, new materials and interior sustainability, aerodynamics with a tour in a wind tunnel, battery cell production, raw material purchase and supply chain management, and the next generation of BMWs. Are electric vehicles really more sustainable and if so, in which way? And what are the really important concise measures we need to take to create a more sustainable automotive industry? <laughs> How to make new cars more sustainable and more efficient? Join me, Thomas, on this tour in 4K, full screen, full length. Let's go! This is the famous BMW 4-cylinder, the BMW headquarters in Munich, Germany. And it forms this building complex right here together with the BMW Museum where you can see the vintage vehicles and the BMW Welt, the BMW World, where you can see the current vehicle lineup, which is, by the way, also one of the main tourist attractions in Germany overall. What are the main factors to make a car more sustainable in exterior, interior, especially in the drivetrain? Are there differences between electric vehicles and combustion engines? And are electric vehicles really more sustainable? We're going to find out all about that. We're now in front of the FITS, the Forschungs- und Innovationszentrum in Munich here at BMW. This is the Center for Research and Development. And with me is Stefan Flöck. He's responsible for the compact vehicles at BMW and MINI. 
So the iX1 or the BMW X1 would be one of the responsible vehicles. So I read on the BMW homepage that you want to reduce the CO2 output by 40% till 2030. That's a number, you know, and people could maybe say, yeah, it's just greenwashing and so on. But what does it actually mean, like for the people and for the vehicles and for the individual parts? In your question, you had two points. The one point, how do we get the, the people motivated to do this? Out of my point of view, that's, that was pretty easy. Is it? Yeah, it was pretty easy because everybody's talking about how can we get CO2 reduction, climate control, and wealthiness. We can, how can we get this combined? And the clear answer is we can get this combined through technology. And we are a technology-driven company that brings everybody every morning into the office because he has, a uh, he has a potential to work on solutions which help uh, this, this overall um, target. Do you also have a personal motivation? Yeah, and my personal motivation, for example, I have three kids at home, they are 17, 19, 21, and we are always discussing, hey, you are there at work and you're working on these premium BMWs, and how, how can you combine this in your head? On the one side, climate control, and on the other side, uh, working in a company like BMW and I, it, it's more and more easy for me that I can say hey we are working on technologies which reduce the CO2 um, the CO2 conductions. But then you have to look at the individual parts of the vehicles. How complicated is that? So in the last years we identified the CO2 footprint of every part of every production technology which is producing the part and then in the supplier chain to the sub-supplier and sub-supplier and we have a clear understanding about the CO2 footprint of every part. Then secondly, based on this, we drilled down the target down to the part. And then we started um, um, figuring out the actual figure of every part compared to the target. So and then you get a gap between the target and the actual figure. And then you can start working on it. And then the third point is that you identify the countermeasures which have the biggest impact on the CO2 footprint for the lowest money impact. Is there any specific example with this compact platform where you can really say, hey, that was something we really achieved already? We have the aluminium rims and aluminium, if everybody knows, is high energy it's in, uh, incentive. There's a huge footprint. 50 kilos of aluminium in a car has a huge CO2 footprint. And the rims they have a heavy impact or a heavy conflict between design on the one side, uh, functionality, and CO2 footprint. So this is a very tricky part to get a CO2 reduction into it. So in our all-electric mini convertible, by the way, it's the first uh, electric convertible in the world, Finally, electric convertible again. Finally. Yeah, but the first one in the yeah, world. Yeah, he so knows I'm a convertible the first lover. One. Yeah. <laughs> we, 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 we made it happen that we have this wheel made out of 100% of recycled aluminium. So that's the first wheel in the world with 100% recycled aluminium. And that was kind of a snow pow for all the other cars in the, uh, in the compact class. And the snowpow made it happen that we are up to 70% of, re, uh, of the recycling quote in the rims uh, in this car, for example. And in addition, we use green energy uh, to, to lower the, the footprint. So we had a heavy CO2 uh, footprint reduction in these aluminum wheels, and we are, I'm pretty proud of that. So does it mean that sustainability basically becomes one core feature of a BMW next to driving fun and premium interiors and so on? That's exactly the point, yeah. Because uh, we clearly think that sustainability is part of a premium understanding. So there are more and more customers who do want to do something for, they, for their <laughs> CO2 footprint. And and they still want to have a premium experience by driving a car. People are still discussing out there, are electric cars really more sustainable than the petrol cars? And 
when is there maybe a break-even point. So you have all the numbers and you have the very same car, you have the strategy is going from the same assembly line, the electric version, petrol, diesel, plug-in hybrid. What's the real relation? You have all the numbers, tell us. Yeah, I know the discussion, we know the discussion and we, we faced the discussion to be quite honest. So um, it's very transparent that the CO2 footprint of an electric car when it comes out of production com compared to a combustion car is higher. So it, it uses more energy to produce a electric drivetrain than a combustion drivetrain. That's fact. But it's fact also that after a pretty low phase in the user's phase, the break even when the CO2 footprint of the electric car in total gets lower than the one of the combustion engine car. It's pretty early in the use phase. And of course with electric vehicles, with the iX1 and specifically, we have to look into the battery production. So how do you ensure that the battery production is actually according to the needs of the customer, what he expects from a sustainable company? Since the battery is the part or the component of the car which uses most energy in the, in the, in the production phase, and already mentioned this, we have the highest focus on the whole production process. So we look into every step of the cell production, of the um, module assembly, and then of the whole um, HVS assembly. We look into every step, and we look into the production process of the sub-suppliers, and we have it very transparent how big the CO2 footprint is. And it's very necessary, because only with this transparency we can conduct the correct countermeasures to reduce the CO2 footprint at the right places. So when you say that the electric vehicle is always the more sustainable one in the long run, why building you know, the other drivetrain still? I think that's a very reasonable question. Thank <laughs> you for that question. I think we, have, we still have a lot of customers who want to buy a car with a lower CO2 footprint. But it doesn't fit into their requirements to buy an electric car because they either can't charge at home or they drive really long distances or they just don't get acquainted with the electric drivetrain. So for them, we need to have an offer as well. And we put the same efforts into always updating our combustion engines. So for them, we get the best CO2 footprint combustion engine cars as well. So this is why we still have them in the portfolio, because there are still some customer which just want it. And do you think there is like a clear direction? Do you think it will be all electri electrification in the future? Or do you think it might go into some other directions, maybe some technology we don't even know or something? Who knows? Uh, we think, we clearly think that the uh, the part of the electric drive is still, is still accelerating, is still going up, but we think that uh, after 25 and even after 23, there will be customers who are requesting combustion engine cars, and we need to have a good offer for them, and we need to 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 do something for the foot for the CO2 footprint for these customers as well. And this is why I think that still we there will be a request for that, and that's why we are putting a lot of effort into the development of our combustion drivetrains as well. Which one would you take, the iX1 or the Petro, or are you more like the plug-in hybrid use case? Which one would you take at the moment? I would take the iX1. It's such a nice driving dynamics and it has a good reach, a very good reach out of my point of view for my um, requirements. And I have, as I already mentioned, I have three kids and even for three kids to be honest, it's, it's, it's big enough in the inside and has the newest, and it has the newest entertainment inside. So the combination of the tall size in the inside, of the newest um, infotainment and of the newest electric drivetrain, it's a perfect match for me. So this one gets then the daughter approval. <laughs> it gets the daughter approval, yes. <laughs> Here we are hosted by Andreas Vetter. He is responsible for the sustainability in the supply chain for exterior and interior materials. And behind us is the BMW X1, or in this case the iX1, the electric version. 
And of course, I want to know which materials are we talking about starting at the exterior? At the exterior, most of the material is steel and aluminum. Most is steel. And uh, so we have only the um, hood is made of aluminum, the rest is of, made of steel. And it's made of steel because steel is uh, not only cheaper, it's also from a CO2 point of view, it's a better material. It's lower available or with a lower uh, CO2 footprint available as compared to aluminum. And of course we have uh, other areas with plastics, we have the glass, and um, so we have in the whole exterior we have all the materials in a mixture like we have also in the interior, you know, so metals, and uh, plastics and glass. Is, there the, is the greatest potential actually in reducing CO2 inside the steel production? Yes, it is. So from our CO2 footprint of in our area, from our department, about 75% of the CO2 footprint is based on steel and aluminum. And the CO2 footprint we have is always only the CO2 which is um, produced by the production of the material and the parts out of the material. So it's always the transformation from the fossil material more or less to the final component. That's the CO2 footprint we are um, counting more or less. So if aluminum and steel is basically like the major factor we can change to make a car more sustainable from all the exterior material, what can you actually do with the material, can you show us an example of how to reduce CO2 inside there? Yeah, um, for instance, for the aluminum hood, we can um, make sure that our producers are using green energy in the electrolysis. That minimizes the CO2 footprint almost. And also to increase the secondary material proportion in the material. So that's two um, measures we are taking so that the can get down the CO2 footprint of the hood. And in the steel, um, we, we are using different kinds of steel. So normally the steel is produced with coke yeah, in the, uh, in the uh, oxygen furnace. But there are different suppliers also in, a, in, in a Europe already which are using the electric light, light um, furnace. Um, or electric arc furnace. So that's uh, steel, they have a high number of scrap, 70%, 75%, some up to 95% of scrap, and also no, only a small portion of this um, raw um, iron, more or less, which is produced with coke. And for instance, this part, which is more or less b below this, this exterior part, um, as a reinforcement for this uh, C pillar. This is made of this electric arc furnace steel with 75% uh, of um, scrap and a CO2 footprint below one. And that's a very good value for steel already. And we have that in different parts of our cars. And for instance, in our US produced cars, we have up to 50% of that kind of steel in there. In Europe, unfortunately, the availability of this material is not so good like in the US. And the goal would be that someday 100%, 100 the car is from this From one. that kind or from um, hydrogen, direct reduced steel. That's the big steel transformation we are depending on and we are waiting for. Yeah. So from a sustainability aspect, you would say that steel for a car chassis is still the way to go also for the future? Yes, yes. Aluminum is too expensive and uh, for a 100% aluminum car. And it's also, from a responsibly, uh, uh, sustainability point of view, it's not uh, as good as steel. Still, steel is, if we can get the hydrogen-based steel and the hydrogen is produced with green electricity, that's... Uh, the, uh, that's the minimum requirement for that. Then it still is still better than aluminum. But of course, in some cars, we will have a lot of aluminum based on other requirements we have 
weight reduction and um, or weight limitations we have to achieve. Yeah. So um, we will not have only steel cars. Like also in this car, we have a hood made of aluminum because our cars shall not be that uh, heavy because the, the more the heavy, balanced yeah, the, it's always a balancing of um, the CO2 footprint in the production or supply chain and the CO2 footprint in the use phase. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The more heavy it is, the car, the more you need for gas or uh, uh, gas in the, in the use phase. Yeah, BMW has also been using carbon fiber, especially in the early you know, i3 model and so on. Is that something you say like, you know, wasn't that useful, we won't use it in the future, or is it something you carry on from this project as for the use of carbon fiber? At the time, as we used it very intensively, it was very good. And for instance, in the i3, uh, i3 we had the chassis made of carbon or in the i8. And at that time, aluminum or steel, uh, I'm aluminum, uh, had a very high CO2 footprint. And so the footprint uh, of the carbon fiber was not that higher, more or less, compared to aluminum. It was less. And now it changed. Yes. Meanwhile, it changed. We have the green electricity in the uh, electrolysis of aluminum, so aluminum is better. And that's why we are not using carbon fiber as intensive anymore like we did uh, in the concepts almost yeah, 15 years ago. Now we're taking a look here at the perforated center tech seats in the BMW X1. How sustainable is such a seat actually? It's always depending on to which material you are comparing. Uh, from our point of view, compared with a leather seat, a seat, it's way more sustainable because the CO2 footprint is about 80-85% lower than compared to leather. If I compare it to a, a textile seat, it's higher. So the textile seat is the most sustainable seat. Mm -hmm. And of course... Wh why, why is that? Is it just like less raw material used for that? Or? Uh, less raw material is the one point, uh, thing. Uh, so the textile is much more lighter uh, than uh, artificial leather. So if I take a look here at the seat and I, I feel the structure, it's really soft and you cannot really differentiate. Is it now animal-based leather or is it artificial yeah. leather? That's um, the target. <laughs> yeah, I mean like visually and like from the haptics, it totally works. But then a lot of viewers were asking, what about the durability? Are you using the same testing methods actually on these materials? Are they as durable or even more durable? Minimum same durability. So would you say, you know, because you're the material expert, that this seat here basically lasts the lifetime of the vehicle? Yes, that's the target. That's, that's the minimum requirement we have, of course. So when this car, you know, goes into like the, you know, into shreddering, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the seat goes along with the vehicle, basically. It dies like the captain with the ship, it dies alongside with, yes. the, with the vehicle. Yes, yeah, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> <laughs> then there is this discussion about the use of plastic and then also petroleum use. Um, is it actually a significant amount used for this very seat? How, like how much material, how much plastic, or, and then how much oil is being used? And also in this like, perspective of the, of the whole vehicle, in comparison. Yeah. So uh, let's uh, start with the whole vehicle or with our area which we are responsible for. So we have about 250 kilograms of plastic in the car. I think with the other departments they have about, we have together 300, perhaps or 350, I don't know. But that's the amount. And the chair or the seats uh, for in the front and the rear together, I think so we have about 25 kilograms of plastic. So it's, from our area, it's about 10%. From the whole car, it's less than 10% is the plastic in the seats. So we're talking like, like a single seat would be like some five kilograms or 10 Something pounds like that, from yeah. 300 kilograms, 600 pounds overall. So it's actually not that a high share overall. No, so no, no. So the seat is almost in the same area like the exterior, um, plastic part from a weight perspective. So if you want to save plastic or oil, it's not about the seat, it's more about 
fuel use, right? Because when we calculate that to fuel, it's like a couple of liters of fuel which you burn basically yes. for a seat. Yeah, but still you need a seat, otherwise you cannot drive a car. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you, yeah. you need a, some, some material for a seat. And for instance, to, to make a 100% wood seat, would not be very comfortable. Yeah, <laughs> that would be, I mean, for, maybe for a living room it's okay, but not, not really for yeah, a car, right? not for a car. And um, we also, as you said, we always have to look at the alternatives. So at this moment, as we see it right now here, this is also one of the most efficient methods. Even more efficient would be than the, the fabric surface, right? Yes, exactly, yeah. Right now, it's, uh, I think uh, it's a very good state of the art, and we are looking for some replacements on, and optimizations, for instance, to, do the, to make the artificial leather more sustainable using bio-based um, ingredients and also the backing as a recyclate, so you can really improve it a little bit more. Um, and of course... I think you have some, some samples right here. Yeah, we have Let's take a look. Yeah. yeah, so for instance, here we have the same kind of uh, leather, but it has this bio-based um, ingredients to make it soft. And also um, um, the, the backing of that material. So here this, this fabric is 100% recyclate. Mm -hmm. And uh, these two uh, measures um, make a CO2 reduction of about 45, uh, 35% of CO2. Yeah? Can you say, is it always better to do more recycling share or what's, what's the challenge there? Um, depending on the uh, material. Sometimes, or as long as we are a multi-material um, uh, component, it's better to have more and more recyclate. If we are able to do that in a mono-material, we think sometimes um, it's perhaps better to do a little bit less recycling but have a mono-material instead of a multi-material uh, material component with a higher recyclate. I have later on, we could be, I have some examples for that. Yeah, and we have also always have to make the decision then which path we are going, but uh, as we want to have more recycled material out of the car again, mono-material components are our favorite, more or less. Yeah, I also heard that more and more it's actually a struggle to get enough recycling materials yes. to work with. Yeah, yeah, exactly. For instance, the fabrics. So every new fabric which we are developing is based on 100% recyclate polyester. The, the material, the surface material, as well as the, uh, the, are, um, the, the material behind that, yeah, which makes it soft and so on. So we are eliminating the, the foam, we are um, using here uh, this kind of fleece for that. But as uh, the, the industry um, for the bottles, they found now a way to reuse their old bottles for new bottles. And so they use all the PET bottles, which we have used for the polyester fabric. Now they are using it by themselves, and we have to find new recyclate um, sources, more or less, for instance. So looking, for instance, for clothes, but clothes are normally not 100% polyester. So it makes it more complex to get the recycled material. Then we also have here, because we talked about seats, but now it's also about the steering wheel. So uh, these are the new materials that actually have then the leatherette as the steering wheel cover here. Yeah, you can for also instance. See it here. It's actually a little bit, um, little bit softer even, right? Yeah, we are also wheel. using that in future models for the seats and for other components, but uh, it has now it's the steering wheel. It's the one... Um, artificial ladder which we can really use in a steering wheel because with steering wheel you always have it in your hands and a lot of people they have um, some 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 stuff on the hand so it's really really <laughs> the, the most um, uh, or the component in the car which has the most influence of chemicals mm -hmm. yeah. And, and so we so have you shouldn't use any like chemical cream or something, not too much grease, not like potato chips. So actually keep your hands clean, then touch the steering wheel, right? Should be that complicated, isn't it? Yeah, but it's, it's, that's, it's good for the steering wheel, yeah. But that's why we had a long time no 
um, artificial ladder on the uh, steering wheel because we had to find a material which lasts also 15, 20 years and the steering wheel has to look nice also then after that time. But now from this new material you can also guarantee that it lasts yes. at least you know, as long as the material so far, the animal based yeah. one, or maybe even longer that it like looks, you know, nicer, even longer, or at least the same. Huh? At least the same. That's the target. That's the requirement. Yeah. No, no compromises here. So if I got you correctly that at this moment it is useful to use recycling if enough raw material is available, if it's not like maybe like over complicated for the whole process. Yes. Other than that, like the 100% petroleum use is still a quite efficient way to do that, especially with when using fabrics or, you know, like an like efficient way to produce the, the leatherette. Yeah, the alternative is often not here. Yeah, we, we, could, we can use leather, of course, but with leather you always have the discussion, hey, the animal has to die for getting the leather. And also the, the rework of the animal skin to leather is also CO2 producing and so it's, it's not CO2 free the leather. And um, in the fabrics of course you can um, work with some um, um, yeah, uh, stuff like cotton or something like that but right now we don't have a fabric based on 100% of an, an uh, bio-based material because we have also the, uh, the, the, this material, the fabric has to last 15 or 20 years without compromises. And our cars are used in, in cold areas, in hot areas, in, in very humidity areas. So it has to fulfill the requirements of all the places where our customers are using the car in the winter, in the summertime, this uh, bed closes, this, this all that stuff. And so it's, it's, it's really, uh, a lot of development work to have a fabric which uh, has um, or fulfills the requirements we have in the automotive. It's, it's really a, a product which lasts 15 or 20 years and has to look nice also after that time, in minimum our, our cars. Yeah. The next step, however, would be then even to reduce the share of raw materials, especially oil and so on. And then you have this next step here. Yeah. We are developing this next step. That's uh, um, we are uh, have a partnership with a new fiber building, and we are developing Myrum. That's a 100% oil-free and animal-free, 100% bio-based material. So this is an, um, you know made of different plant-based material. Is it a mix, or how how can I? Yeah, yeah, it's a mix of different materials. Um, uh, yes. And then you can have basically, is, is it the same material, but just yeah. a different stamp? Yeah, because you, when you take a look at this one here, this more looks like, like from a, like a more raw surface with more texture in it. You can see here, it really feels different. A little bit like cork, maybe yeah. a little you, bit. You can, yeah. that's the thing with uh, the, the kind of artificial letter, you can stamp every single different surface on it. Yeah, so you can do it this way or um, without any um, structure or whatever structure you want, an animal structure or an uh, technical structure, that's, that's a big advantage. The amount of how much you can get out of it is higher than from a hide from a cow, yeah, because a cow always has little um, yeah, injuries and, and so on, and stuff which the customers don't want to see in the seed or which are also a weaking, uh, weakness for the material at that place. So. We, are, we have to cut them out, and so the usage factor of um, a hide is much lower than from this um, artificial uh, material. You also have uh, more examples here from inside the vehicle, for example, door panels from the inside and so on. Um, so here you can more and more raise the share of plant-based materials. Classic, classic uh, door panel is based on 100% plastic for all those carriers and so on, yeah. And of course we can get here recycled material in there up to 30% in some areas, in some areas a little bit more, but it's a crash area. So we have to be careful about, we cannot do 100% recycled material. And in the i3, um, we had this door panel uh, 
based on this um, nature fiber, flax or kina fiber um, uh, material, and we are starting models. That's, that's the raw stamping of that um, component. Yeah, it's, He seems to do weightlifting at home. Yeah, totally, totally. so it's, it's more or less one centimeter thick um, uh, fleece, which gets pressed more or less in a first step. You have it then more or less pressed down to you have two or three millimeters thickness. And then in the final uh, pressing, you have it only a more or less a one millimeter thick. Yeah. It's, so it, it's in the I3, but is it I3. something we can now find in today's cars or in the new cars coming up, like the Neue Klasse, the new electric vehicles? We will see that again in, in other cars again. We had that a long time also in other cars um, because of late, lightweight. Um, but then we went back to more plastic um, for different reasons. And, but we are now going back and uh, looking to, for instance, in, in, this, in, in the different areas to, to substitute the plastic, for instance, for, uh, for this area. And that's the developments we are making here, but also for the whole carrier again. We are looking forward to do that. And we will see that in the new class, uh, not perhaps with the first um, models, but with the later coming uh, models, I think we will see that again. Yeah, it's a re, yeah, a rethinking on, on that material. We have talked about the carbon fiber, and uh, we see some supposed to be carbon fiber parts here, also super light. These will be used in on future BMW M cars. But actually, you told me earlier that this is not real carbon fiber, is it? No, that's uh, flux fiber. That's so it's, a, it's a kind of like a plant-based carbon fiber, look at that. <laughs> yeah, more or less, yeah. It's the same like this material, yeah. It's just a kind of webbing of the flux fibers, and then you are mixing that with um, plastic in, for the external uh, parts with epoxy, in the internal or the interior parts with PP, and then you get out this material and they are same like way like a uh, carbon fiber and uh, we are looking forward to replace some of the areas of this decorative parts which we are making of carbon fiber for our cars um, now with the, this kind of material. So you see how even BMW M cars then can get more sustainable then you can tell your friends hey you know I got a great engine under the hood but I still or, 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 <laughs> or a new BMW M electric vehicle but you can use actually plant-based carbon fiber. So making a car more sustainable is really looking at every single individual piece. Also, for example, the floor mats. And uh, you told me earlier that there are actually two ways we have to look at it. First of all, reducing the different kind of materials, yes. making one piece from one material. Yeah, that's the And the second way. thing, then the recycling share. Exactly. Here the Floor mat in the X1, like what's the percentage here at the moment? So it's a 100% mono material, so it's only polyester. So all the scrap which we are producing while producing this um, floor mat can be recycled again to the same material. So we are, based on the, all this blends, we are producing new floor mats also. And also at the life end uh, or end of life of uh, the floor mat, you could recycle that uh, again. And the other stuff is to have recycled material. Here we have 65% of recycled material. So it's only for 45% we need virgin material based on crude oil. The rest is recycled material. Why is it not yet 100%? Is it because you cannot get it that clean as for the material? Is that the thing? Or? Yes, that's one reason, and sometimes also it's an, a, a question of availability. This floor mat is produced in China and in Europe, and uh, so we, we, we have to make concepts which are able to be produced everywhere where we are producing that. And if we have in some markets limitations to get that recycled material, so we have to make compromises in the amount of recycled material also. Otherwise, we would have two different concepts which have to be checked and proved and developed. And so it's, that's why we have sometimes limitations in our world cars, which we are producing all, all over the world.
And this mono material approach, is that something you mainly do for the post-processing so that then it can be recycled later on or is there another reason for it? In a normal floor mat, all these stamp outs are burned, are getting burned, so CO2 is um, coming from. And also at the end of life, uh, one day, so this car will, will be yeah, shredded more or less in 15, 20, 25 years and perhaps until then, we have some regulations or other ways where it makes sense to get out the floor mat, put it in a specific container for polyester, and then it gets, get, uh, it gets uh, recycled and not burned anymore. So this is, at this moment, more like a future-proof concept which can yeah. be used better because we now have to think about what happens with the car in 10, 15 years when there are different yeah. regulations and so on. Today, no floor mat will be taken out of a car, it will get shredded. But perhaps it, it changes in 15, 20 years. Yeah, and that's a concept already for the future. We are thinking also at our recycling at the end of the life. By the way, luckily, Andreas is not uh, responsible for the color combination of this vehicle with green, blue accentuations and the brown seats. So, um, yeah, <laughs> there are better combinations for the X1, definitely. <laughs> We have talked about aluminum versus steel, and you generally say steel, especially for the chassis, is better as for the sustainability factor. But we still need some aluminum parts for weight reduction reasons, and wheels is actually one thing. But why is it so important with the wheels, actually? For the unsprung weight, to minimize that. That's why we have a lot of aluminum, or we have aluminum wheels. And also for design reasons, because with a steel wheel you are not that free in designing a, a cool wheel and our customers may want premium wheels which are nice design, so that's why we have aluminum wheels. So this is now a mini example then? Yeah. Why do we have it here? That's a very special thing, it's a hundred percent recycled material and so from a technical point of view it's really feasible with the metals to have a hundred percent secondary material there's a very low um, CO2 footprint. For aluminum, it's only then 0.2 if you are using natural gas for um, recycling that material. And that's why we have it. And for instance, the, our mini Cabrio uh, BEF, which we had in this edition, this 900 cars, they had 100% recycled um, wheels. But it's not feasible for all the wheels we are having every year in, in, uh, in our group. But from this year, every new aluminum wheel which we are developing will have in a minimum 70% secondary material. And for aluminum, it's, it's a huge thing, right? Yeah, because like the raw process to get you know, from the raw material to aluminum is like really intensive in energy yeah, use. Very it? high energy intensive, yeah. So if you don't have a secondary material, it's about a CO2 footprint between four and six kilograms for a kilogram aluminum. And the secondary uh, material you can get, get down. For, for instance, if you have a really pure quality, high quality secondary material from aluminum scrap, it's only 0.2. So for some materials, recycling can actually be quite a challenge, but for aluminum, as I heard, everything speaks for it, basically. Yeah, aluminum, steel. For the metals, it's very good because they keep the technical properties. In, in plastics, uh, you, if you are doing a mechanical recycling, you have a decrease of the properties of the material. And that's why we cannot have, in every area, 100% recycled material. We have it in some parts in our cars where we can afford that or where the requirements are that low so that it's still fitting. But in a lot of areas, we are not able to get to 100% mechanical recycle. So we have to have virgin material or substitute the virgin material with bio-based uh, plastic or this chemical recycled plastic, which is uh, in, the, in the early steps of development. Have you heard that? Aluminium, aluminum? Yeah, I'm more this American German, he's more this British German, right? <laughs> <laughs> BMW is one of the biggest German customers of Alcantara. The famous brand, who produces microfiber seed materials, is located an hour north of Rome and we could take an exclusive factory tour for you. And like anything you can get in the automotive industry, it is of course also a factory complex. 
It starts all with these small PET pellets. They are now also available with recycling. For example, the first time here for the Ferrari Puro Sangue Alcantara seats. In this first factory step, the small PET pellets are being melted and being pushed through a tiny hole. And then you have these threads. They're hanging all over the ceiling in this first production hall. You see there are the dark ones or here the bright ones. That depends on the color later on. But there are these two base colors for brighter or for darker colors. Then they are being washed, transported further and are being pulled tight. And then happens a very quick process where they are being unraveled but just on the outside part. So the inside part of the fiber stays intact but the outside part becomes unraveled and that one later gives this Alcantara structure at least a part for it because if you would not do this step here you would rather get for example a slick leatherette. This again happens for both colors and here this is the first dryer because after this first washing process you need to dry them first. Then they are getting sucked in. Here, by the way, you can feel and see this first unraveled product and it almost becomes fluffy like a pad of wool or something. And everything of that is being packed into 200 kilo blocks in both colors, the dark one and the bright one. Then they are being brought into the next factory hall. Here, this giant vacuum cleaner sucks the fiber in again and transports it to the next machines. That looks really old school machine alike, right? Here, these fibers are being pulled to some kind of carpet. They are being folded layer over layer over layer again. And then some giant stamping machines actually condense the material and made of multiple layers. You can for a first time feel actually already this, let's say, half finished material. This one is already a somewhat finished roll. Then the next step, here, the second component of Alcantara is being added, PU. This one is done on a chemical basis and this process is actually off limits for camera, for security and also for secrecy reasons that no competitor can copy it. Next step is the dyeing process. Here, colors are being added. This is not done chemically, by the way, so they want to have a more environmental approach. They get into these huge washing machines, 20 hours by 120 degrees Celsius, and then the colors are being sucked into the fabric, just mechanically. After being dried and rolled again, you have the final Alcantara product with all of its very fine structure. Here, by the way, the difference, the black one is with flame retardant for automotive use, the gray one here without flame retardant on the back side for furniture or clothes or something. New colors can be mixed directly in the workshop, by the way. Here they can combine different colors and make unique colors for each manufacturer, for each client. This is the new complex manufacturing facility where they go a step further. So you can either as a customer go for this raw product and do it yourself for your own seat as a manufacturer, or you get this complex manufacturing service, then Alcantara is actually cutting the material for you and process it further. The advantage is that they can better individualize things on their own than inside their own factory. So here then you have these smaller pieces of Alcantara where they, for example, add these red stripes. Have you ever wondered how that one works? So here there are these huge stamping presses and then they are being put on the material. Once again, they are being cut out on the outside parts then, and then the workers are controlling if everything matches the templates. Also, this is one of my favorite processes. They brush the final material that it has a very clean and nice look. Here you can see also another technique. This is this perforation that another color is shining through from the background also used in the Alfa Tonale. Here, and this is, by the way, this stamping finishing process that you have the color combination together also with physical stamping that you have this three-dimensional effect on the seat. Yeah, don't forget to brush it. <laughs> Different colors are once again being used also for the final processing. Yeah, they also can be funny <laughs> inside the factory. This is also one of the high-tech areas where they have these automatic sewing machines for the contrast stitches. This one here, for example, for Opel, Stellantis, 
company is also a very huge customer for them here for the Opel GSE models, the sporty ones. And then we see more final samples right here for different manufacturers, different colors, contrast stitching, also these three-dimensional stamping and different forms. Very interesting what you can do. For example, also for McLaren. And then we can see these final samples here, Alfa Romeo, Porsche GT3, for example, BMW M Performance. BMW is one of the big German customers of Alcantara and Jaguar Land Rover as well, or Hyundai with their N products. And here we can see our final Alfa Romeo Tonale parts. This is another interesting technique where you can see how this is being done, this laser stamping, I would call it. So there's another fabric in the background and then there's an Alcantara mat on the foreground. And then there is this laser engraving to have these really, really fine details that the background color can then shine through. Different parts here, by the way, Microsoft Surface, for example, use it. You can have book covers, shoes, or even bags. They also have this compartment or for example, for furniture, pillows, and it comprises about 15% of the business. However, automotive is still the biggest. This is how it all started then back in the automotive industry. Lancia was one of the biggest customers. And here from our editing studio, let's talk about the plastic argument. Because what I often read, especially when we talk about alternatives to animal skin leather is, wait a minute, aren't these alternatives based on plastic or then based on raw oil and actually yes it is the case as we have already seen here in the Alcantara production of the microfiber so you can either take a raw oil base that is then further processed plastic these small pellets and so on and then you make these highly evolved materials from it or alternatively as we have also shown here in the Ferrari Pro Sangue with the high recycling share. So the question is always, is it bad in comparison to what? What are the alternatives? So what do we already have available? And what material has the highest impact? The question is actually easily answered. Animal skin leather has the highest impact on them all. Humans, animals and also the environment. First of all, always includes animal cruelty. Then in the process, also toxins are being used. These chemicals are also having impact on the water and so on, and people are suffering from it. And even if you leave all ethical aspects aside, the whole CO2 output is just the highest, beginning from land mass use, then the whole efficiency in the production, energy, water use, and so on. And manufacturers have already acknowledged that, and that's the reason why Every major car manufacturer has already dropped out of animal skin use, at least long term. Some are quicker, some are a little bit slower. But then the question is, what are the alternatives and is it actually bad that they are plastic based? So a base fabric seed is also an artificial material and that is usually not in discussion. But that has a similar impact if we take here a microfiber or Alcantara seed. High-grade leatherette is a little bit thicker, uses a little bit more of the material, but then we have to ask ourselves, what are actually the main consumers of oil? That is fuel, heating, and energy production. Then just a small percentage is used for plastic production, and that can be done in a quite efficient way, as we've seen here with Alcantara, for example. There the problem is just if plastic or particles are left in the environment as trash, or are getting into the ocean. What is the main cause of micro, these microplastics in the ocean? Old fishing nets. So always search for the biggest lever you can pull. And when is plastic being thrown into the environment? Plastic bags that are thrown anywhere. Or for example, if there is plastic particles in fashion in underwear, which is washed, hopefully, every day, but it's not a problem if it's, for example, in clothes that are not washed, for example, like, like huge jackets, which you don't usually wash, or a car seat is not being ripped apart mid-car cycle life and just thrown into the environment. You know what I mean? So I'm not at all a defender of plastic material, but at this moment, in most cases, it is quite efficient and it's also one of the best things we have. And we always have to compare it. Yeah, what's the alternative? So at this moment, there are 
two good alternatives. A, use recycling. It is already being done using recycling share, but there the question is, is the recycling process efficient and also clean? So you have to take full circle there as well. And is there enough recycling raw material available? The PET bottle industry has already started to use their own bottles again. So that is also diminishing as for the raw material source. And it can be better to have a mono material as well that you can then later on recycle again. The other approach is using plant fibers or also a plant-based oil or for example processing plants that you then get like this, you know, these alcohol products, uh, um, products from that which you then can use as a replacement for oil again. So all these approaches are there and already being done. At this moment science is on a way that you have like this share and can in increase the share of it and then at the end of the day there are always some prototype materials out there where they go 100% recycling or 100% plant-based or mix these. So there the big point is everything is possible. It has the greatest potential. And even if you think about inside a vehicle, the seat is about like five kilograms of high-grade leather rent, maybe two and a half kilograms of fabric or microfiber, so even half of that because the material is lighter. Here Alcantara is also pretty light material. And then you have like 300, 400 kilograms of plastic in the whole vehicle. So even inside the vehicle, if you want to save plastic, then maybe rather start with the doors or in the trunk, in the cover and so on. So there's way more potential there. So the bottom line is, if you want to save plastic, if you want to save oil, go for the fuel heating energy production side or in the vehicle, everywhere else, but not majorly on the seat, you see. So that's how I always try to tackle things. Where is the biggest lever I can pull? That doesn't mean that the other problems are not there, but there is the potential also to tackle the small problems. So technology is on its way. And the most important thing is to use the potential of these new modern materials. So if we want to reduce the use of raw materials on the exterior of the vehicle, Aerodynamics is a huge lever we can pull, especially for electric vehicles. And with Sven Furch, he is the manager for aerodynamics for the small vehicles at BMW and Mini. We're going to take a look at the individual details which help aerodynamics here again with our iX1. Sven, can you explain which are the main factors you can control to improve aerodynamics here? First of all, I would like to mention this closed kidney grill. So on this um, electrical version, this kidney grill is uh, completely closed. This helps uh, the aerodynamic for a better flow uh, in this area uh, to go over the bonnet. And it's also very important to optimize this edge to help the flow um, going over there without uh, resistance. So when a designers would actually say we want it like completely flat and more angular, you would say, no, nah, no way. Um, it's always... Um, um, a discussion. So we have a very good contact to our design colleagues and we discuss every detail. So sometimes they, will, they would like to have uh, some details and we, uh, we are looking whether we can realize it. Um, on this uh, particular edge um, we are working to a compromise. So um, as you see the BMW iX1 has a very prominent front. Um, so design was able to make some of this but was also respecting the uh, aerodynamic um, points we, we, which we need uh, on this area. Yeah, because this has been a big discussion that the BMW W King is getting wider and wider and also larger in this respect. Is that something where it's like, ah, is this really a problem for us? Or would you say like, you know, we, we can manage, especially mm -hmm. maybe like with electric vehicles because they're close yeah. anyway? Or? Yeah, 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 yeah. So we will fi always find solutions. For, but it's so very important to have this uh, discussion to get the best solution or get even new solutions uh, for, for these areas. So would you generally say a larger double kidney for the petrol is a problem, but for electric it's not a problem at all from aerodynamic standpoint? Um, it depends uh, on electrical cars. Uh, they are normally closed. So for uh, aerodynamic point of view it's uh, not an issue. Um, for the petrol-driven cars, um, it's, also the, it's always the question how much uh, cooling is needed for the car. But that's a very good uh, point. Um, we have a demand-controlled uh, cooling. So that, even on petrol cars, here, right? that's right. So on petrol cars, we have um, 
uh, demand controlled uh, cooling uh, on the upper side and the lower side. On this BEV uh, car, we can see uh, here this uh, air shutter technology. So normally it's closed and it just opens if the car um, needs some, some cooling. And it can open in uh, various positions. So we try to keep uh, the, the air shutter as close as possible. So usually the designers like to build a very massive front and you might say like, hey, like the more massive the front is, you know, it has to really push against the wind. But is this actually the critical issue for aerodynamics or is it somewhere else? Um, it's, it's one part of aerodynamics, but the, the back of the car, we'll talk later, uh, is also very, very important for aerodynamics. And... Um, helping to realize some uh, design points. Um, we are uh, integrating on, on some vehicles also these um, uh, air curtains. So these air curtains help to get a prominent front um, and helping the airflow to go right. most efficient um, uh, to the side of the car. You can be wider without losing you know, too exactly. much. Exactly. exactly. But as far as I understand, it is more important how the car is being pulled from the rear, you know, with all the turbulence or vortex behind yeah. it. And it's not that important how much it pushes in the front. Is that correct? Um, you do not have to make failures in the front. So you, you have to be aware that some edges have to be optimized for aerodynamics. Um, but as you already mentioned, it's very important to have a really optimized aerodynamic in the rear of the car. Then there's, of course, also the wheels. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, maybe know like some prototypes or some racing cars from like, you know, post-war racing cars or something. Yeah. They were completely closed at the side. You couldn't even see the wheel. Yeah, yeah. I guess that would be like the optimal standpoint aerodynamics wise, but the designers would go crazy. So um, mm. what's the solution there to optimize the wheels, but you can still see them actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. We can, uh, I can show it on, uh, on this car particularly. It's uh, fixed here, by the way, so the, the car doesn't yeah. get loose in the wind tunnel, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. this uh, has to be mounted for wind tunnel tests um, because uh, we are operating the cars uh, during operation um, with the wheels turning and, uh, and the wind. So uh, it how, has how, to be... how fast can the car go here, actually, on, so this, on, the, on this one? On, on this specific uh, test dyno, it's the Aerolab from, from the BMW Group. Um, we can drive up to 300 kilometers per hour. 300 kilometers per yeah, hour. That's like 190 per miles per hour. Like, yeah. like, so the wind speed is coming from there, actually, from this that's right. huge hole. So like the turbine's like actually in the top, and then the wind goes through here. Exactly. And that's a speed of 300 kilometers per hour, 190 miles per hour. Up to, yeah. So we would actually like fly away instantly yeah, well, so, if we were standing here now and it's, and it's running. So that's the reason why it's not running and not in operation right now. So, but this is more like for racing cars and not for yeah, yeah, this yeah. and the speed. Yeah, and yeah. So like what is the typical speed you would test this vehicle on? Mm -hmm. uh, normally we test the vehicles for aerodynamics uh, at 140 kilometers per hour. So that's the typical uh, speed where we optimize the aerodynamic behavior because that is a, a speed where aerodynamic is very relevant because probably uh, everybody knows that uh, uh, wind resistance starts to, uh, to be the, the biggest influence on resistance around about 75 kilometers per hour. So like 45 miles per hour. Yeah. So um, yeah, I once heard this figure that up, like when you begin this speed, so driving yeah. on the motorway, mm -hmm. Then, especially with electric vehicles, two-thirds of the whole consumption is accounted yeah. for aerodynamics. That's right, and yeah. the rest is like how efficient the drivetrain is, maybe yeah. the weight of the vehicle, rolling and, uh, resistance, rolling resistance and right, so yeah. on. Mm -hmm. So when we drive really slow, mm -hmm. it's not, this, you know, not such an important factor. Yeah. But when we drive motorway really fast, yeah. aerodynamics is basically the thing. Yeah, it's the main factor. That's right. So um, almost uh, two two thirds um, is the influence of uh, aerodynamics uh, driving at 130 kilometers per hour. But uh, as all bicycle uh, users know, um, the wind starts already at very low speeds. So uh, around about 25 kilometers per hour, the wind starts to to uh, to generate resistance. Is it like, you know, like a, like a linear curve then, or is it an exponential? It's exponential. Exponential, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah, like consumption, basically. You yeah, know, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, that's very So we, we did talk about the wheels, or we started to talk about the wheels. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we could close them all off, then probably everyone would say, like, that doesn't look 
you know, good enough. Mm -hmm. But here it's the, this compromise, you know, it's, you have this aerodynamic optimization at the side here. Yeah, 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 yeah. First of all, it's very important to have a, a good area for the flow going to the wheel arches. And after the wheel arches, it's very important to optimize these areas. And on the wheel itself, we are optimizing the shape and also the rims. And uh, on this particular um, rim, you can see there are some uh, areas hidden, so the airflow uh, will have a lower resistance uh, on such wheels. I can also see really tiny vortex generators here yeah. at the side mirrors. Are they just design, or do they play any role, actually? Um, they, they, they play a small role, um, but we do have to respect um, safety uh, issues, so we are not able to make uh, uh, big wings uh, on this area uh, due to other uh, people uh, going uh, along the, the car. Um, but it also helps for water management, for example, and it's also, of course, uh, design. But for aerodynamic reasons, if you could optimize as you like, you would put them also there, but just make them even bigger at the side mirror? Yes. Yes, but it's, it's not possible if, if uh, a passenger goes along at the, at the car, um, you are not allowed to, to make something like this because uh, they could be, could be um, injured. Um, just mm -hmm. don't step on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I don't want to make you stumble here. Yeah. Uh, so about the, um, the door handles, there has been a lot of yeah. discussion because we have seen so many new door handles. In, in this case, we can still, you know, like manually open them like this mm -hmm. and we also have a feedback, but they are still like kind of integrated. Yeah. But we've also seen with other vehicles that we have completely flush door handles that mm -hmm. are absolutely integrated and maybe move out. Yeah. And sometimes the feedback is kind of weird or yeah. then I have my hand here, suddenly the car closes itself and then my hand is stuck. So we have experienced everything about yeah. it. And then my question is, how important are flush door handles? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we know they help definitely, yeah, yeah. but is it a crucial thing or is it more like we can live with or without, it doesn't matter that much? It's, uh, it's, not, it's, it's not a big thing. So uh, aerodynamics, having a good aerodynamic uh, on a car is not being decided by the design of, uh, of the door handles, but we are optimizing every detail of a car so um, if we are um, able to, to choose one the option, so we would prefer these. So this is basically like this compromise because they are somewhat flush, but you still have like a manual opening here that it yeah. doesn't have to go out. I think that's, to me, yeah. it would be a good compromise yeah. between, you know, like the, the practical thing to handle it actually and still having the, the looks mm -hmm. and the aerodynamic efficiency. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But more crucial is it actually Much towards more. the rear, isn't it? Much yeah. more important. So. Uh, I would, I would almost say the most important area of a car is the rear of a car because um, you have low pressure in the, in the back of a car and uh, that's the area where the, the forces are being generated which keeps the car backwards. This is actually what, what is also measured here, yeah. right? So you can one, you know, you can have like the, the separate wind lens yeah. we, we used, but uh, yeah. This one is also, you, you told me that this actually can weigh the car, yeah, but in exactly. all different dimensions. Yeah, that's right. How, so, how does it actually work? How, do you, how can you actually then decide what's better or worse for the vehicle? Yeah, so um, we are standing on a very big weight uh, measuring uh, instrument, so and it can measure weight in different directions. So actually now we are being measured, we too, and the car. Uh, <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> um, uh, but it can also um, measure uh, forces in the lateral direction. So if the wind um, is trying to push the car away, uh, it generates uh, a force, and this force is measured by this uh, system. And then you can judge uh, whether the car is better or worse, or if you make a modification, you can decide, oh, this measure helps to improve aerodynamics or not. Yeah, um, actually, the wind comes in here, and then yeah. you made this part a little bit longer, actually. Yeah. So um, is it both and also design and aerodynamics at the same time? Yeah, um, that's a very important area of the car. Um, we are trying to get the car as small as possible in the rear of the car. So that's the reason why this uh, edge is going quite deep uh, for such a, a SAV car. and. Uh, 
we are also trying to get the flow on this uh, so-called arrow edges, um, being in, at the car as, as long as possible, that the airflow is being separated on the car um, in a very small area in the rear. So everything the basically like runs together like a raindrop. That would yes. be like the ideal that, form. That would be ideal, but the, otherwise the car should be two, uh, two meters longer. You, here, these three-dimensional tail mm -hmm. limbs, I mean, when we look at them as a customer, yeah. we may think like that's just a design thing because it looks cool when it's yeah, yeah. three-dimensional. Yeah. But that's also aerodynamics yeah. here, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So we are, we are trying always to, to, to have edges on the car where the flow can be separated. Um, and uh, so therefore the designers created um, these uh, taillights uh, due to our demands for having edges on the car in the rear of the car. And the same also accounts here for the, yeah, for the lower part. That's right, yeah. So the, the air goes here and then you try to basically make this one longer actually. Yeah, it that's right. Just cuts off. So you're responsible here for the smaller vehicles, mm -hmm. but when we just talk about aerodynamics, mm -hmm. you know, we always think about like a smaller car is more efficient, less yeah. raw material used, that's true. Yeah. But just from aerodynamics actually, so you say it would be better or more efficient if the yeah, yeah. overall car would be like five yeah, yeah. meters, you know, yeah, yeah. or well, like 200 inches in length, actually. Yeah, if you, if you look at the very early uh, electric cars with uh, solar power, uh, you could see they are very, very long. So as l if the cars are longer, it is helpful for aerodynamics, but we are also finding solutions for smaller cars to get a good aerodynamics. So actually, then the challenge for making smaller cars more aerodynamic is even greater than for longer cars. Yeah, of course. Looking at new vehicles and especially new EVs, we of course have to focus also on batteries. To find out what BMW is doing with their batteries and their raw materials, we are visiting the new battery research center in Pasdorf near Munich. Here, BMW is researching the production of their own battery cells to get the full knowledge about the process. However, they won't use them for mass production in their vehicles, which seems a little strange. Having such an effort just to discuss on eye level with their suppliers? Martin Schuster is head of battery cell development at BMW Group. What I wonder, you are researching the battery cell yes. and even research how to produce a battery cell. Yes but you're not going produce, to produce it yourself. So you're right. how, does it, you know, how does it fit? That fits very, very, very well, because you have to understand the battery cell in product and process. And I think the battery cell is one of the complexest things in the automotive industry at the moment. So you have to define from the material, from the technology, but then to understand the process. A battery cell is product and process. So you have to understand it. Here we produce around about um, one million cells per year. In our competence center, um, very focused on development, around about 5,000. So it's a scaling, but not on the totally uh, lineup of a 20 gigawatt hour. It's just to understand product and process. But will you use uh, the cells here then also in like prototype vehicles or something, or, but we won't see them in real serious production? You're right. You're fully right. Uh, we use this for testing. Uh, if this process, process parameters, we have around about 3,000 parameters to identify, to understand. And then we use it for testing in some prototype packs, but not in serious production. Uh, I was just imagining like, uh, you know, you buy a transmission from ZF and you would, you know, develop a transmission then yourself and tell ZF what to do. No. There, it's, it's usually, yeah, that wouldn't happen because they are the experts. But then here with the cell manufacturing, the suppliers are also the experts. And they may be like angry at BMW that you are researching that yourself and then tell them what to do or what to change. No, it's a, it's a good question. Because, um, look, when we discuss with the cell manufacturer, you have to discuss on an eye level because we want the best cell. We want the best cell. We need the best cell for our cars. So you have to discuss on a product and a process uh, eye level with the same manufacturer. Um, they know how a gigafactory works. We don't know it yet. We come a step closer with this to understand and then we can discuss it very, very deep 
always focus on the product, the best product. And uh, then last but not least, with this competence from development, from purchasing, from production, we can gain the forces together and discuss this uh, then with the sales supplier. And that's no, we are no competitors. We are fully open, be transparent and to discuss these topics with the sales supplier and it works very well. It's a success model from the past. What do you think can you actually do to make cell production even more sustainable? Because after all, this will be a huge part of the yes. sustainability strategy. Yes. Sustainability is one of the topics we want to create much more here. Because how much recycled material is in a cell? Up to in a target and later target 100% recycled materials. Um, but you have to increase it. Uh, that we can do. We can try here. The second thing is how you produce. Reduce the energy consumption because that's one of the most important topics during battery cell. And you can try it or we can try it here in a small scale. Um, and then discuss this with our cell suppliers, opportunities to go the next step. That's, that's a big opportunity for us and also for the industry. And um, we are really convinced that the sustainability is one of the top targets of VMW. And so we can have a big, um, big part of it. What is the next concise step for the batteries? Is it a solid state? Um, and can you maybe like, get rid of certain materials, maybe without cobalt? There are also models mm -hmm. out there already who work without cobalt. Or maybe uh, you know, use completely different materials. What are the next steps ahead? Uh, first of all, I think the lithium uh, battery cell is the top at, at the moment. And uh, long history, and we think it's still a long future because lithium, iron, uh, lithium um, uh, battery is what you're looking for. For the future, I think all solid state, you know, we are also participate with some uh, play players uh, in the world and we also work on it very, very closely. Uh, but we think not before 2030 in a big scale up. You will see some demo cars for sure, but not in a big scale up. Uh, and then I think the iron phosphate, um, You have to look on, on sodium batteries, you have to look on manganese-rich batteries, you have to look on all this kind of stuff. This we do in the focus in the battery competence center from a development part, material part, and if it's um, rife uh, enough, then we can change it here to build up, because the processes are nearly the same. And for all solid state, we will also do a prototype line here, because to be in front of the battery industry and not always take what's existing. We have to think about what's next. So the next step would be to make the existing lithium-ion batteries more sustainable, more yes. energy dense, yes. at the same time yes. less energy in yes. output in production. Yeah. And, and I think there are two ways. The one is high energy, high nickel, uh, and then the sustainable way, reduce the cobalt, uh, reduce the CO2, use um, Uh, recycled materials more and more um, and these are the two steps you have to do you have to do and the next steps we will see what's coming up but uh, i think we are well prepared for the future with our battery competence center what's going on one of the main aspects is also that in the production renewable energy is being used yes. i heard you want to step up that game even further so at the moment You tell your suppliers you have to use renewable yes. energy. Yes. And what is the next step there then? The, the step is the same, 100% renewable energy. So um, you do it by real renewable energies, like here you can see the solar panels on the, on the roof, and also um, wind, solar, and this kind of stuff. And um, that's the way forward. It's 100%, no excuse. And here for you a quick insight into lithium-ion battery technology. The anode side of the battery cell consists of a copper carrier, which is coated with a so-called slurry, a mixed fluid which contains graphite. This coating process we can exactly see here. The cathode side consists of an aluminum carrier, which is also coated with the material mix, including the cobalt and lithium. Between the two poles, there's a separator layer. All of these three layers are being rolled to a cylindrical round cell. Basically, when the battery is empty, the lithium ions are on the side of the cathode, whereas they are moved to the anode side when the battery is being charged. 
Basically, both processes are about converting energy, electric energy to chemical energy and vice versa. The following infos concerns the current BMW Gen 5 battery modules, which are used for example in the i7, i5 and the iX. BMW buys the two critical raw materials directly and then leads them over to the cell manufacturers. Samsung in Korea and CATL and EVE Energy in China and from 2024 also Northvolt in Sweden. This is a special purchase system to ensure that they have control over the whole supply chain to know that no raw material from doubtful sources is being used, plus they can better ensure a price stability over these raw materials. Cobalt is purchased in Morocco and Australia. By that, BMW also rules out cobalt from Congo, however, they are engaging in social development projects on location. Lithium is bought from four different suppliers at this moment, will be five different suppliers beginning from 2024. The lithium mines are in Australia, Argentina and Chile. The main suppliers are Genfeng in Australia, who use traditional mining, and Livent in Argentina, who uses water mining. The latter one is often criticized for high water usage, while it depends on where exactly the water is being used and how because there are different extraction methods that are criticized also on different ways. BMW has now invested in a startup that aims to make these processes more efficient. They have also employed external control agencies to control their sustainability goals. And they have also teamed up in a project where indigenous people are also taken into account. The next Gen 6 batteries at BMW will already save 60% of CO2 output in the production comparing to the current Gen 5 batteries. Still in a global supply chain, the challenge remains to be responsible and environmental friendly at any time worldwide, for example to avoid child labor and hazardous impacts of mining. Wieland Bruch, spokesperson for product sustainability. How is BMW tackling that? Yeah, first message it is not only something we tackle from today on for the future, we actually have quite a track record when it comes to the topic of sustainability in the supply chain. You might remember that we started with electric mobility 10 years ago and from the very beginning we not only had a strong focus on CO2 optimization in the supply chain and on environmental aspects but also on social aspects. And to be very clear, uh, child labor is not acceptable. Not when it comes to cars, not when it comes to mobile phones or consumer electronics. It is not acceptable with any product. And this is our deepest conviction. And to address that topic, uh, we started 10 years ago already with a team of uh, 30 employees where their main job is monitoring our supply chain when it comes to sustainability aspects. And monitoring does not only mean we work out a contract with the supplier who then gives it to the sub-supplier and then we say ticking the box, contract is done, we mentioned everything we want to get. No, this is not sufficient. These 30 people actually monitoring what is happening in the supply chain. Monitoring with sort of investigative tools, but they are also traveling the world and having a look at all our supply chains, um, whether we comply with everything that has been contractually uh, determined. This um, observation of the su supply chain, you started that with the BMW i project, and, now, and now you basically because that was only these few vehicles, but now you're expanding it actually to all products, to all cars. The supply chain, uh, when it comes to materials like lithium and, and cobalt, uh, you need them for uh, the whole model fleet. And the BMW i3, uh, 10 years ago, was only the very beginning. Meanwhile, we have 18 different um, fully electric models already, and we are securing for their whole supply chain that our standards in terms of sustainability are being uh, fulfilled. Um, uh, and one aspect, and where we are probably different from other manufacturers, is that we are not only monitoring um, 
and then trusting um, that uh, things happen accordingly to contract. No, we travel there, we inspect the mines, and we even buy the raw materials from the mines and we then give them to those who manufacture our uh, battery cells. So that means we have very many touch points as a company to see how all these standards are being fulfilled. And when we have an indication that there's a violation of our uh, policy, uh, we certainly um, uh, fight this with uh, very concrete measures. So after all, in the raw material process, there is, of course, energy use, mining, and for example, the water mining also mm. in Chile and Argentina. Mm. What can BMW do as a company to make these processes better? Because after all, it's an industrial process. Mm -hmm. There's, of course, always some kind of mm -hmm. impact. Mm -hmm. But what can you actually do to make it better or maybe to find new techniques? Yeah, I think with our monitoring uh, process and with uh, the procedure that we buy the materials from the mine, the mine that we have uh, checked, and then give it to those who manufacture the battery cells. These are key aspects where we, after doing so for some years already, think that is a very good procedure. And of course, we have to pay attention that now, where the need for raw materials is increasing because the fleet of electric cars is increasing, that we um, uh, establish or that we keep these standards for all the different sources we have uh, for those materials. But the basic, uh, the, the principles, they stay uh, the same. Where do you personally see the biggest potential yet to make the whole car production process and also getting the raw materials even more sustainable from now on to the future? Yeah, we, we have various uh, aspects in the supply chain and uh, when we can focus a little bit on electric cars, of course, the battery cell is a very energy intensive project. And um, what we have achieved already is that in battery cell manufacturing, all the energy that is used, electricity, that the electricity is a green electricity. The next step can be that also those processes which are not uh, done by electricity uh, also uh, are optimized in terms of uh, CO2. And um, you have heard uh, about the big uh, transition from oil and coal based uh, energy uh, to for example hydrogen energy. We have first examples in our uh, wider network where we start this transition uh, already. For example, as of next year, we are using hydrogen also as an energy form in uh, our Leipzig uh, plant. And uh, there are uh, different steps forward. And uh, sustainability and energy optimization uh, is uh, not something in the raw material chain. It is also something in uh, car use phase where our electric powertrains become more and more uh, sufficient. You have heard about everything that comes with uh, generation six. And also when it comes to recycling and to circular battery cell, these are the wide areas uh, where next potentials um, will be achieved. There is actually an example where we can see where these Gen 6 batteries are being used, and that is the so-called BMW Neue Klasse. And we have taken a look at that one for you. So we have talked a lot about sustainability, but what does it concisely mean for a future BMW vehicle? They show that here with the Neue Klasse. Let's take a detailed look at that. And I have heard that 90% of what we see today will be the next BMW 3 Series electric. So it's really worth to take a detailed look here at this vehicle. Here in the front, we can already see this is a so-called shark nose taken from old BMW models. So the top part laps a little bit over. Also interesting how the front bumper here really has this hole making like a real use of the bumper again. Can we see a light show again? <laughs> because there's also here in the front, you can see the double kidney is at the same time a headlamp unit is basically both. And this is a very interesting approach. And what we can also see that, you know, from the BMW iX, this really huge, maybe beaver grill, this is more, again, this horizontal stress. But I think it's a really interesting approach to combine kidney and light 
because air intakes, you really don't need it anymore. Very interesting indentation right here. And then the BMW logo is really stands on it. You can really feel that there is no chrome on this vehicle. You might wonder about the Neue Klasse naming. Isn't that Mercedes? Klasse, like E-Klasse, C-Klasse. That's the German name for E-Class, C-Class. Well, they didn't copy from Mercedes. Neue Klasse was actually a naming from 1962 until 1972. And it was a model that was preceding the actual BMW 5 Series. This time here, it will precede the BMW 3 Series. We've also seen recently the Mercedes CLA concept. This one here is more an approach that has more angular design. Mercedes goes more into this round direction. This one has this rather typical sedan style, of course, electric platform, 21 inch wheels here, and a massive styling, also with recycled aluminum. That's a new technology they are using, and this brings down the CO2 in the production already. With aluminum, it's one of the biggest lever you can pull when you use recycled aluminum because it takes so much energy to use it as a primary resource. And that's also the scheme of this whole vehicle, bringing down the CO2 already from the production because that's so crucial even more with electric vehicles. Here, this belt line you can see, this would be the normal one and they actually enlarge the glass housing to the lower part, they signal it by that. And you remember maybe past sedans, you know, from back in 30, 40 years ago, they had more greenhouse and they want to bring that back actually. The size or length, once again, like a BMW 3 Series, but they promise a space on the inside of the BMW 5 Series. And we can see this classic sedan styling here in the rear. Also, once again, the light signature, it goes almost all the way across, has a little split here in between. So they really continue the front design also here in the rear. And once again, with this bumper that stands a little bit out, this sprinkled material, it should also signalize using recyclables materials and so on. So it's both using recyclables for the car and later on that you can recycle the car, the materials that have been used and once again, going all the way circular. It will be built in the plant in Hungary, and that is also set up for a CO2 neutral production as for the energy, everything powered with renewable energies, for example. As for the hard facts, like, you know, battery range and so on, they don't announce something concise yet. They just say that the range and the efficiency and also the charging times, everything will be improved by 30% if you compare it to a nowadays BMW i4. So maybe we can aim, at least in summertime, ideal conditions, some 600 kilometers or 370 miles. You know, or maybe, depending on the version, the battery version, if you go smaller or bigger, maybe 5 kilometers, 300 miles. And also charging times of 20 minutes, somewhat 10 to 80%. So this will be, uh, will be a huge change. And this platform here, this Neue Klasse platform, will be used for six different models, not only for the three series, but also for vehicles at completely different sizes. So now I will try to use the force to open these doors here. There we go. Yes, I have learned very well. <laughs> Inside of the doors, we can see they have this bright yellow color scheme now. Of course, different colors will be available at some point. Fabric on the top part, then here's some microfiber use, integrated touch buttons. Mm, yeah, that's not to my liking. I like, you know, real stuff to touch and feel. But I found this microfiber steering wheel pretty cool. Flat bottom, that looks very futuristic, but also racy. Wow, and this bright microfiber is also pretty cool. And look at that, return of cord or corduroy. I remember the E30 BMW 3 Series from my grandmother, and it had this cord material on the inside in black, however, here now in yellow. And it has a very special feel to it and some kind of structure. And it is not decided yet, actually, if they will return with this cord overall. But if you vote in the comments here, you can push BMW towards it if you like this cord or corduroy material. I would love to see it in a serious production vehicle once again. And you know that the manufacturers, they read our comment section and then they also check out the customer feedback from you. And then they can also take the feedback for real production cars. Seating position here in this, you know, this feeling here, it feels really spacious because of all that glass surrounding here. You can see the, the front windscreen is put way down there. So we have to see, but as I said, 90% of things you will see will be series production model, so it is actually already quite realistic. I still have some headroom with 189 or 6 for 2 there's no problem. And it feels actually like mid-size sedan alike 
in a way, but then again, here it goes really wide in the front, so the spacious feeling is indeed present. More fabric use, it more feels like a living room, actually. And you can maybe also already see a glimpse of that. There is this new so-called panoramic vision, and that is a blending of instruments and head-up display, and it will also actually blend with the screens here. So you can actually then move parts from the screen here to the part in front of that. So this is this interaction between the two screens, which is a completely new idea, actually. Am I supposed to move the steering wheel here? Maybe no one is watching. That's a lot of fun. Oh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I, I'm allowed to do that. That's a lot of fun. It almost feels like go-kart style, right? And here, this cockpit overview, you can see the screen has a very interesting new form, leans a little bit towards the driver. And here you can once again see how I can move with two fingers and send stuff then to this virtual dashboard in the top of the screen. And it really blends a little bit between the digital world and the reality. I can very well see the speed right there. Projected range here at the moment is 476 kilometers and battery status of 68%. Hmm. And we'll see if that one is actually realistic. Temperature control will be here in the lower part as sliders. Yeah, I'm not sure if the physical buttons will return at some point. I hope, but of course there will also be voice input and so on. And the gear selector here is in that lower part. I suppose you will be able to flip that actually and press here on park mode on the side. You've maybe already seen when I use the temperature here, also the screen changes to the temperature, so to speak, like warmer or colder. And we can also activate the sport mode here and we also have a reaction both from the screen and from this digital head-up display field there in the front. And you'll also be able to control this head-up display here with swiping gestures at the steering wheel. If you take a look here at the floor, also how the front seats are attached, everything seems to be flying or is a little bit you know, elevated from the ground. Hey, that's maybe good for vacuum cleaning, isn't it? <laughs> and of course, the even floor, the bottom of the vehicle that you use all of this EV platform. So, and then, of course, as for the legroom, it fits for tall adults. See, the angle of the legs could be improved maybe in the standard version, and also underneath this glass roof, I can still sit here. So it is actually for adult proof, even though it's a concept. More bright microfiber use and so on, and this whole interior is animal leather free. So it is a whole vegan interior, of course, not only good for animals, humans, also for the environment, because it's here the biggest lever on the interior you can pull to make an interior more sustainable. So my two favorite features are the angular Bauhaus style on the exterior and the cord or corduroy seats on the interior, reminding me of the BMW E30. And then on the mini side for the all new models, here the Mini Cooper, the small one, and also the bigger Mini Countryman, they have already implemented some of the details we have been talking about, like more recycling share and also less energy use in the production. And also all Mini interiors are now animal free, both seats and also the steering wheel. Well, this is the most important part of the research here. <laughs> this is Panther. It's a she. Yeah, obviously by looks you can judge her name. So she's always taking part in the extensive research in the automotive industry, of course, especially with walking on my keyboard and uh, giving some fake uh, commands to the, you know, to the editing program and so on. But back to a more serious topic. Just when we were doing our feature here, for a very, very long period of time we've been doing this. And this also had a good reason because during that time, things can also happen. And one of the bad cases indeed happened for BMW. So talking about the cobalt resourcing, here, one of the main suppliers, the one from Morocco called Managem, they are also directly related to the Kingdom of Morocco they actually got blamed for polluting the water with, with arsenic. And this was a journalistic group who were collaborating with local people on location where the mine is. And then they found downwards the river a high concentration of arsenic and also had a laboratory um, researching that. It's a serious topic here, lady. Yeah, 
she doesn't understand. It's good that she doesn't have to care about these problems. So back to the problem. Um, yeah, <laughs> everyone who has cats knows what this is about. So back to the arsenic problem. So there is a strong evidence at this moment that this mine has been polluting the water with arsenic. Plus there's also claims that they are mistreating the workers there. The company themselves, they deny these allegations. And now BMW has to act. So they filed in two different independent audits to find out what's going on on location. Because obviously if that evidence would be tr like 100% true and also 100% related to this mine, BMW would have to cancel the contract immediately and go for another resourcing and this company is to blame. Of course, as it is in the economy, BMW cannot just cancel the contract because someone said this happened there. They have to find out themselves, also have an external proof with another agency, for example, because when you are in this contract, you just cannot cancel it. That's also a legal thing. So they have to find basically a way to confirm that and then they can also cancel the contract if the allegations are true. And this is a very you know, good example how this supply chain management works. In this case, however, BMW were not the ones finding out about that, although they also have close monitoring and so on. But a journalistic group found out about that together with the local people. So you see that these control systems not always work. We have to find out more about the story at a later stage. When we were finishing this feature here, the audit was not finished yet. When it is finished, I will also put it in the pinned comment below what was the result of that and how BMW reacted on that. So what have we learned today? First of all, the most sustainable vehicle is the one that is already built by a used car or hold your current car just longer. But clearly we will still build new vehicles in our society. And then it makes sense to make them as sustainable as possible. Electric vehicles are first from production, less sustainable, need more energy and resources because of the battery production. But then, and actually already quite early in the life cycle, they get more sustainable from a CO2 standpoint. Then of course it plays a role, how will the battery technology evolve? Can we use less rare materials in these batteries? Will there be all new battery technologies that make the whole battery more sustainable? So for me, the battery electric vehicle has the greatest potential. That is actually the crucial point to be more sustainable even more in the future. Then on the exterior part, aerodynamics plays such a huge role, especially for electric vehicles. As for the hardware parts of the vehicles, chassis and so on, it's very important to use steel that is produced in a more efficient way. And overall the car production, the assembly line, energy and heating, these are the two main aspects. And of course the best is if they come from renewable resources, renewable energies, this is also happening already today, but not in all plants and not to 100% share. This will then be the future. As for aluminum use here, for example, for the front hood, most important thing is here using recycled aluminum. Recycling on the interior part, it really depends on the individual part if it's used for or not. Here at the moment, the solution with leatherette or fabric from 100% petroleum without recycling share is actually a quite efficient solution and we also heard that it is not using as much oil as we would maybe expect. So it's a small share from the whole interior oil or plastic use and if we compare it to the use of oil in fuels for example or for heating overall it is basically not that significant. Future there will be plant-based materials which even then are better in the CO2 balance this will be then the next development. And of course the biggest lever we can pull is to get rid completely of animal skin based leather on the interior of a vehicle for environment, animals and the people. That is actually just a factual base and I hope you really enjoyed our insight here for today. Give a thumbs up and subscribe if you like it and also tune in to our next reviews.